Life isn't easy. We all have moments of struggle, hopelessness, and despair. The day-to-day -day can begin to take its toll. And before we know it, we're consumed, overwhelmed by stress, surrounded by fear, unable to see the light through the darkness. It's no wonder we lose our joy and forget what peace actually feels like. But there is a way, a way for hope to break through our walls, a way for our faith to be renewed, a way for comfort to surround us. We can once again feel the light shine brightly on our face. We can experience the warmth of God's love and watch the darkness be overcome. For it's in the light of Jesus we find peace. Hey everybody, good morning. Grace and peace to you. Happy New Year. I hope you and your family had a great Christmas. Uh, I want to thank you so much for your prayers. You know, there's always somebody who gets sick over Christmas. It's kind of the joke in our family. Who's going to get the reindeer flu this year, you know? Uh, so it was me this year. So thanks for uh, your prayers. I appreciate it. And speaking of prayer, um, I heard uh, recently that uh, Logan and Aubrey... Uh, lost their baby. And uh, I, I, I say, let's pause right now and let's pray for, for them uh, right now. Lord, uh, we know it's, it, it's not your will uh, for death. We know it's not your will for illness. It's not your will for all of these horrible things that happen in life without answers. Uh, but one thing we do know is that you're with us in the midst of the pain. And, and today, Lord, we pray for your loving and healing and peaceful presence to be with Logan and Aubrey. Surround them today. Um, just be with them. And may this church surround them with love uh, may we surround them in such a way that they know that God is with them. So we ask your blessing upon uh, Logan, Aubrey, uh, Dina, and family. Uh, we love them and we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So today uh, we kick off our Epiphany sermon series, and it's called Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Now, bandwidth is a computer term. Now, I am not a computer geek, so if I butcher what bandwidth means, please forgive me. But bandwidth means something like the maximum data transmitting over a network at any given time. The larger the bandwidth, the more data can go through. Now, we might not know <coughs> what bandwidth is, but we do know when our internet is slow, don't we? I, mean, I think we've all come to, or your cell phone and your coverage is, is weak. We know the feeling of that. But bandwidth is not just a computer term anymore. It's something that's used quite often in normal language. We might say things like this. I just don't have the bandwidth to add another thing to my plate. I just don't have, I just don't have any more energy to give. I just can't handle another thing. I don't have the bandwidth for it. That's terms that we understand, not having the resources to do what we need to do. And so we might say, I just don't have the bandwidth to do that. Do you relate to that? Not having the energy, not having the resources, not having uh, any room on your plate. Uh, bandwidth. We want more bandwidth to be able to do more. So this sermon series uh, over this epiphany season that takes us to Lent is about this epiphany, this revelation, this aha of who God is and who we are. And, and that epiphany, that aha, that light bulb moment will influence our bandwidth. And I don't know what God's going to say to you over this season, this six weeks of epiphany, but I believe it's going to be something to do with 
who he is and who you are. And at the end, at the end of our time together, at the end of this season, I pray all of us have a better understanding of what God desires for us to do. And maybe our bandwidth will increase along the way. Also, uh, uh, that term bandwidth, I love the idea of bands. I love music. I love rock bands. And we'll talk plenty about music throughout this series. So bandwidth, and we're also going to talk about bands. If you are a Methodist, if you know John Wesley, he had this idea, a beautiful, amazing idea called bands. And they were this idea of, you maybe heard of Band of Brothers, or your, your little group, your, your people, working together, living together, moving together through this journey of life. And so we're going to talk about bandwidth, but we're also going to talk about this idea of having soul companions, people on the journey, people to help us through. And so we're going to kind of play around with both of those ideas. So be prepared to be thinking about what your favorite band is of all time, and also be thinking about do you have people in your life that know you, that really know you? Do you have people in your life that can look at you when you're down and, and know? Whether you call them accountability partners, encouragement partners, soul companions, or whatever, we all need our people. Amen? We all need our people. So there in this series, we're going to talk about that. So why, why is it that we don't have the bandwidth to do what it is we want to do. For some people, uh, they're in the room today, you know grief will interfere a lot with our bandwidth. Grief is heavy. Also, trauma and wounds are heavy. And then there are many people in this room today dealing with whether it's physical illness, emotional illness, mental illness, spiritual illness, relational illness, it zaps your ability to do what you want to do. The church has to talk about this. The church needs to talk about what's really going on behind the scenes of our lives. And so as we move into 2024, we continue our journey of healing, continue our journey of vulnerability, continue our journey of being honest with God and one another about our brokenness. What if this lack of bandwidth that we are experiencing has to do with the expectations that we put on ourselves and the expectations that people put on us. What if this lack of energy to do what God's calling us to do maybe has something to do with isolation? And I say that, and here we are in a room of people, But the truth is, we can be isolated and still surround by people. What if this lack of bandwidth to do what God is calling us to do has to do with disconnection? Disconnection from one another, and most of all, disconnection from God. So here's the big idea for the entire series. Here you go, you got one big idea for this whole series that we're going to talk about. It's this, the way of Jesus is not just difficult to walk alone, it's impossible So let's walk together. Will you say this with me? The way of Jesus is not just difficult to walk alone. It's impossible. So let's walk together. Our Jesus story for today is the baptism of Jesus, the baptism of Christ. The first Sunday after Epiphany every year, we talk about the baptism of Christ. It is so important. Uh, for the church to understand the significance of this particular story. When you walked in the back of the room this morning, if you came in the back, uh, there was a baptismal to your right on the corner. And in that baptismal, there's some water. The significance of having the baptismal at the entryway to the church is incredibly important. As we come into our gathered space as community, we look over and we see that baptismal and we are remembering our baptism. We, uh, in some church traditions, they put their finger in the water and stir the water. Some uh, cross themselves. All of those are beautiful. But the, cons- the consistent element of walking by that baptismal every week is the reminder of who God is and who we are. And the truth is, the, um, and, and again, I'm not saying you're old. I'm saying I'm old. The truth is we forget our baptism more often than we remember it. 
The context of this story is John is baptizing people in the wilderness, not in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem is occupied by the superpower Rome, uh, and 90% of people, um, uh, the Israelites at that, that time, uh, were poor. Rome taxed the heck out of them. Rome taxed and taxed and taxed to the point where there was nothing left for them. They had no financial bandwidth at all. But also being home and not really home, I mean, they're in Jerusalem, they're in their hometown, but the reality is they had this occupying power. They weren't really home. They were home, but not really home. They didn't really fit. They were waiting for something to happen. They were waiting for someone to come and save them. They, they were incredibly disconnected people. They were incredibly isolated people, even though they were surrounded. Their thought pattern in that day, not, not much different than today, was if I sin, that means it's going to take longer for the Messiah to come. Or if uh, the Messiah is not coming, maybe it's because I sinned. And so there's this kind of prosperity gospel that was a part of that culture that you know, if there was a problem, it's because somebody sinned. If things were, if you were blessed, it means you were doing something right. And for a lot of people, they were uh, being very, very self-critical of their spiritual life. So when John shows up and says, hey, uh, you know what, let's, let's welcome the Messiah. Let's be baptized. Let's get a clean slate. Let's start over. Let's repent. Let's turn a different direction. It was an opportunity for everyone, all those people, uh, outside of Jerusalem, to have a new hope for their future. And so John is baptizing. So that's a beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, what really amazes me uh, is uh, verse number 9. Let's, let's look at this. In those days, Jesus came from, where did he come from? Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Does anybody know anything about Nazareth? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. Now, I, I don't know what, every, every place we've ever lived, there's always a town nearby that you don't want to live there. I, I don't know what that town is here. Anybody want to throw it out? Well, I probably just shouldn't say it because somebody in this room probably lives there. But in that town, the place you did not, in that time, the place you did not want to live was Nazareth. Nazareth had a particular accent. People knew if you were from, they had like this like hill country hick accent outside Jerusalem. And people knew if you were from Nazareth. And so if you were from there, people looked down on you. And we'll see that in the weeks ahead where they, they talk about nothing good can come from Nazareth. Jesus came from Nazareth. Jesus came from the place that nobody wants to be. And it, it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Not a palace, not a castle. Jesus came and was born and lived in hill country. He was raised in the poorest of towns with a heck accent. And every time he talked, everybody knew he was from that place. Our Savior shows up in these places. Baptism is taking place in the wilderness. He enters our mess. I, I, what I find significant about Jesus being baptized is he didn't have to. He was perfect, right? He didn't sin. He didn't have to be baptized. So why did he? The other gospel talks about him entering into kind of like almost like getting in the line to be baptized. I, 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 I love doing um, pictures on AI. So I got this picture here. Uh, th this is what AI, I said, give me a picture of Jesus uh, standing in line to be baptized, and that's what AI came up with. But imagine being there, and here is this Savior, Messiah. Of course, they don't know that, but he enters into a line to be baptized. He didn't have to. So why was Jesus baptized? Why did Jesus in the, stand in that crowd like every other person in that place, every other poor person in that place? Why did Jesus just enter the line to be baptized when he didn't have to? It's this beautiful truth that Jesus enters into our mess. He enters into our grief. He enters into our pain. He enters into the, the junk of life. He comes into that. Doesn't have to. 
but he does because of love. And today, as we contemplate our overwhelmed feeling and our disconnection in life and relationships, Jesus enters in even now into our low bandwidth, overwhelmed life. Jesus enters in here, in this place, with you who are worshiping online. Jesus shows his solidarity with humanity. Jesus loves everyone. Now, verses 10 to 11, uh, there's so much here, but I just want to point out a few things. And just as he was coming up out of the water, Mark, by the way, Mark, we'll spend a lot of time in Mark and John throughout this year. Mark is the action movie version of the Gospels. I mean, he, he uses the word immediately, like over and over and over again. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Short little uh, power tweets, right? They're, they're, they're not long descriptions. So this is just a little description of uh, the baptism. So he come out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart. The heavens ripped open. It's interesting that idea of heavens torn apart is the same Greek word for the uh, the veil in the uh, temple was torn in two. This is a game-changing event that's taking place. This is a world-shaking event. The, uh, the heavens are rent uh, apart. They are torn apart, just like the, the uh, veil in the temple was torn in two. Opening the door for God and humanity to have this relationship. And then it goes on and says, uh, the Spirit descended like a dove on him. Um, so, so we have the Spirit here. We have Jesus in the water. We have the Holy Spirit. And then verse 11, we have the voice, and put verse 11, the voice of the Father from heaven saying, you are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. So we have Spirit, Son, and Father all right here in the baptism of the Trinity. Now, why is that important? Well, the Trinity uh, and, and nobody understands the Trinity, so I'm not even going to try to explain it. But what, what is so significant about the Trinity is that the Father, Son, and Spirit love one another. There's not like the Father's on top, and the Son is like, you know, subservient to the Father, and the Spirit's off to the side as the crazy uncle. It's none of that stuff. It's the Father, Son, and Spirit on the same level loving one another. The, the scriptures are, histor historically, the church fathers came up with this idea of the divine dance. They're, they're loving one another. Father loves the Son, loves the Spirit. They're community. So this idea of, of the Trinity is this idea of, of God is in relationship, uh, in, in community, in Trinity. And I know it doesn't make sense, but here's the interesting thing. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, which we read Genesis on Wednesday, but a little bit further in Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, God spoke, let us make human beings in our image and make them reflecting our nature. So God is creating, and he's using the plural form uh, of creating because he's cre as the Trinity. He's, we are created in the Trinity's image, the triune image. So God is in community, and he creates us to be relational beings, to love just as the Father, Son, and Spirit love. A little bit later, it says it's not good for man to be alone. We are relational beings. Part of what it means to be created in the image of God is relationships. We are created to be in relationship one to another, but relationships are hard. Whether it's a marriage relationship, family relationship, neighbor relationship, social media relationship, it's all hard. But when we don't have a relationship, when we are isolated, when our relationships are broken, there's something missing. We live in a day today where the uh, nuclear family, our, our, our immediate family, has almost become idolized. Where our only relationships are in this kind of little network right there, this real small network. But God created us in such a way that we are to have relationships beyond our nuclear family with those that we call the family of God. The Trinity is a reminder that we are created in the image of a relational God, a communal God, and we are created to have relationships one to another. The next uh, beautiful part of this passage is what the Father says to Jesus. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. So why was God pleased to Jesus? Because 
Jesus was doing miracles. Uh, Jesus was preaching amazing uh, knock-it-out-of-the-park sermons, right? Uh, uh, Jesus was uh, bringing in all kinds of money to the disciples in the church. Uh, he hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't done a thing. He's been a carpenter's son. He's worked in the shop, right? He hasn't done anything of spiritual significance that we would call works of God. God, before Jesus even did anything, said to his son, I love you just the way you are. You're my beloved child, which means I love you and I'm well pleased with you. So what, what did Jesus take with him when he went into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan? I'm a beloved son. My father loves me. As he went to his hometown back to Nazareth and people spit on him and wanted to throw him off a cliff, what did he hold on to? I'm a beloved child of God. This beloved identity. When he went to the cross and he was abandoned by just about everybody, he was there alone. What did he hold on to? His beloved identity, that he was a child of God. Jesus took that identity everywhere he went. Now, historically... When we're baptized, we are reminded of that identity that we are beloved children of God. We are reminded of that identity every time we walk by that baptismal. We are a beloved child of God. What identity Jesus had is given to us uh, because of his love and death and resurrection on the cross. We are beloved children of God. But we forget it. At least I do. I, for whatever reason, think that I am how big my church is. Or I am uh, how big my house is. Or I am what kind of car I drive. Or how much money I make. Or how much uh, social media friends I have. The world tells us so many things about our identity. But the true identity... Our beloved identity is that we are children of God, but we forget that. We forget that. We walk by the baptismal and we don't even look over at it. We don't ever put our hands in the water because that's a Catholic thing to do. We don't, would never cross ourselves. In fact, many of us, because we're baptized as infants, don't remember our baptism. Maybe we were confirmed and remember it then. But we don't really know that we are beloved children of God. And that's why it's super important when we gather as the church every week, we hear that phrase, we are beloved children of God. You are a beloved child of God. Because without that, we end up working ourselves to death. We end up having all of these expectations thrust on us because we want to be successful or make money or whatever. And before you know it, what happens to our bandwidth? It's gone. I believe that the biggest reason for our low bandwidth is, at least from this pastor, this person who loves Jesus with everything, the biggest reason I don't have the bandwidth I wish I did is because I forget who I am. If I would remember that I'm a beloved child of God and God is pleased with me just as I am, that I don't have to change everything and be successful and preach these great sermons. Or If I f follow in the footsteps of Jesus, as we journey in the way of Jesus, we realize that he loves us as we are before we do anything. Henry Nouwen, who is one of my favorite theologians, uh, he, he said this, You are not what you do. You are not what you have. You are not what others think of you. You are a beloved child of the Creator. I think that is true. And I believe that one of the greatest things that we can do is to remind ourselves of that identity. In fact, I wonder what it would be like if we had people in our lives that at least once a week, maybe twice a week, would look us in the eye or send a text message or whatever and say, you know what, Paul, you want know Jim? You know what, Anita? You know what, Oliver? You are a beloved child of God. 
and God is well pleased with you. Maybe that bandwidth issue wouldn't be quite the issue because we wouldn't be trying to do. We would spend our time being. And there is a world of difference between our identity being about what we do and our identity being about being a child of God. So again, the big idea, the way of Jesus is not difficult to walk alone. It's impossible. So let's walk together. We need each other. It's great being in this room together. It's great worshiping online together. Let's do that. But let's go further. Let's build relationships. Let's find our people. Let's find a few people that we can journey with that knows us who we really are without the masks and the facade and all the fake smiles. Knows us who we are. Look us in the eye and say, I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm with you. I hurt with you. You are loved just as we are. I think our bandwidth issue would begin to change when we know who we really are. Because we have a God who loves us as we are. As you are. Right now. If you're like me, you're a broken mess. Or is it just me? It's all of us, right? I, I, I joke with, uh, you know, every Sunday somebody comes in and tells me, you know, what's going on in their life. And, and I joke with them. I was like, you know, look at us. We're just this big church, this messy church. We're all broken you know, it's just, we're a big mess. And I think that God is glorified in the mess. When we don't try to pretend that we're not a mess. But rather, realize that he loves us anyway. You know what this world needs and the city needs? I mean, there's a lot of great churches out there. You can go to some churches and you can hear some great rock music, you know. And I mean, you know, they play some excellent music and, you know, the lights and the fog and all, all that. You, you can go to all those churches. You can go to churches where there's a crowd of thousands of people and you're in this room and everybody's singing together. That's great. But you know what I think this city needs? Finally needs a church. A group of people. We're okay in the mess. Not having to pretend. Not having to put a fake smile on. Not have to say the Christian F-bomb. I'm fine. We welcome Jesus into our mess. And he stands with us in the mess, in solidarity. He doesn't have to, but he does because he loves us. Friends, you are beloved children of God, and God loves you just as you are. Our job as a church is to remind ourselves of that. That's our identity. And everything that interferes with that, everything that interferes with the beloved child of God, any sin or anything that breaks us, isolates us, disconnects us, we look at it as an illness. Just like John Wesley taught us, sin is illness. And we look at it in empathy and compassion towards each other. And we help us move beyond where we are today. Amen? Amen. But I tell you this. People ask, well, why don't you talk about sin more, Pastor? Which really means somebody wants me to talk about somebody else's sin. Because you don't ever come to the pastor and say, preach about my sin. You want me to preach about somebody else's sin. I preach about sin quite often. But here's the thing I want you to know. For real healing to take place, talking about sin takes place in a small group of a few people who journey together, who know each other inside and out, who are open and willing to take off our masks and being honest and open with each other. Confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. That's where it takes place. So I'll talk about sin all day long, probably more about my sin than anybody else's but we need to talk about it in the places that really, really matter when we really can talk about it. And in those places, we are reminded of our identity as beloved children of God. That's what the city needs, friends. It, it needs a church that stops pretending that everything's okay. And just be a safe place for people to come in in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of the mess, and they find Jesus amongst these people that 
are a mess. At least that's what I think. But I really don't know anything. I haven't realized that. Ask my family. You haven't really known anything. But I'm just being honest. And I think what you need from me, more than anything, is a pastor who's honest with you. Here's the challenge. Who can you remind this week that they are a beloved child of God? Who can you remind? All it takes is a little text message. Who can you remind? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the baptism of Jesus. We thank you that the heavens were torn open and the Trinity is revealed of love. Lord, you have come to bring healing to this broken world and these broken lives, to cleanse us and heal us from sin so that we can be the people of God who love you with our everything and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Help us, Father, to be open and honest with each other and with you and help us to find our people in the midst of the crowd that we can share life with, that we can open up to, and we can remind each other that we are beloved children of God and you are well pleased with us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for salvation. And we ask you, Lord, to be with us today and the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen.